This is part of the Book of Physics series on electromagnetism. This is part two of conformal mapping. In part one, we introduced the bilinear transformation, which is used to map shapes in the Z plane over to shapes in the W plane. And basically, we were concerned with circles and lines. Circles and lines under bilinear transformations map to lines and circles. Uh, the bilinear transformation is given by AZ plus B over CZ plus D. Z is a complex variable, uh, X plus IY, and there's a restriction that the product AD is not equal to BC, and that so this transformation function won't be a constant. What we concluded with the problem of determining the interior solution of a very long cylinder that has the potential specified on the boundary. So because it's a very long cylinder, it's essentially a two-dimensional problem. So basically, we're looking at a circle here. And in the particular case, the upper circle, the upper half, was grounded, and the lower half was at V0. And as it turns out, by means of a particular bilinear transformation, we were able to map this over to here. Remember, it's not just the contour, but it's also the region of space as well. So this is why we took this path in a counterclockwise direction. It's the region to the left of the contour as you follow the arrow that, um, that's a region of interest. So in other words, if we had taken uh, the arrow in a clockwise direction instead, that would have been the exterior solution. Okay, so anyway, interior, uh, we take it in a counterclockwise direction and by means of the proper transformation function, we're able to map that over to a straight line. So this interior region mapped over to the upper half plane of the W plane. And there were a couple of things here. I pointed out that um, although you could just guess at the transformation function, this is actually a procedure for deriving a bilinear transformation that has the proper properties. In other words, you can map the shape that you're given over into the shape that you want. Another point is, is that I didn't justify why I can just write down an analytic function that satisfies these boundary conditions and map it back and that's the solution. So that's another uh, theorem that I, I want to cover in today's lecture. And I also want to go over some more examples of um, solving cylinder problems of various sorts. Okay? So the first thing though is that I want to derive the bilinear transformation that maps this circle into this straight line. Okay, so this circle uh, was a unit radius, so that means that A is at point one, B is at I, C is at negative one, and D is at negative I. Okay, so a, which lies at point 1 in the z-plane, we map that over to 0 in the w-plane. We want to map point B over to 1 in the w-plane. C, we want to put that at infinity. And D, we want to put that at negative 1. Okay, we can use cross ratios to derive the proper transformation function. So, Transformation function, as it turns out, only you only need three points to specify um, because we are just dealing with circles and lines here. So this is equal to z minus z a, z b minus z c. All over z minus z c, z b minus z a. And there is a similar expression for corresponding to the W plane. So in order to derive an expression or derive a functional uh, derive a transformation. that we need to set these two transformations equal to each other. 
So plugging in values here, I think we only need the first three points. So this is W minus zero. One minus infinity over W minus infinity. And one minus zero. These uh, terms with infinity will just cancel each other out. And basically you'll be left with W on the left hand side. Now we just need to do the same thing, plug in the points A, B, and C. Z minus 1. Uh, Zb minus Zc is i plus 1. And we have Z minus Zc, which is Z plus 1. And then we have Zb minus, so this is i minus 1. And so basically, I do the math here. These two terms are just equal to minus i. So therefore, your transformation function is Z minus 1 z plus 1 is equal to minus i. And that was precisely the transformation function that we used to map this circle over to this real line. So basically, inside of the circle to the entire upper half plane. It does make a difference uh, the order in which you take these, these numbers. So uh, let's suppose instead that you wish to map this interior solution to the lower half plane, how would that change things up? So let's suppose I wanted A to be at infinity. I'll have B we'll have B still at the origin, uh, I'm sorry, one. C at zero and D at minus 1. So in this case, the arrow would be going to the left, and then consequently you'd be mapping the interior solution to the bottom half plane. Let me change these numbers over. These the same. Let's change these numbers. i z plus 1 over z minus i, which of course has a different form for the transformation function that took the interior to the upper half plane. So now we're taking the interior to the lower half plane. Okay? Okay, so that is how you drive the bilinear transformation that has the proper behavior. Now I next want to show that if I find a um, function that's analytic and also satisfies the proper boundary conditions, that in fact is a solution of Laplace's equation.
we'll uh, restore this to the original problem. I'm going to define what is meant by harmonic. Okay, so you can call some function harmonic. can be said to be harmonic if its second order derivatives are continuous in the domain and if it satisfies Laplace's equation in that domain. So in other words, it has to satisfy a second partial derivative of phi, say, with respect to x plus the second partial derivative of phi with respect to y is just equal to zero. Now, here's the theorem that we use. justify uh, finding an analytic solution and say, yes, that is a solution of Laplace's equation. So if some function, we'll just call it f of z again, and writing in terms of its real and imaginary parts, is analytic in a domain. Functions u and v are harmonic in that domain. In other words, they satisfy Laplace's equation. Well, let's recall what is meant by analyticity. Uh, first off, Cauchy Riemann conditions must apply for equations. And it's to say that the partial derivative of u with respect to x is equal to the partial derivative of v with respect to y, and the partial derivative of u with respect to y is equal to minus the partial derivative of v with respect to x. And then we also have the condition that the uh, derivatives are continuous. Okay. We use the Cauchy-Riemann equations to uh, to prove this theorem. So we take the second, um, take the partial derivative of this first Cauchy-Riemann equation with respect to x, so therefore we have uh, second partial derivative of u with respect to x is equal to the second partial derivative of v with respect to x and y. And then over on the right hand side, uh, the second equation, second partial derivative of u with respect to y is equal to minus second partial derivative of v with respect to y and x. Now because these derivatives are continuous, I can switch the order of the partial derivatives. So in other words, the second partial derivative with a v with respect to x and y is equal to the second partial derivative of v with respect to y and x. So therefore, uh, we wind up with second partial derivative of u with respect to x is equal to minus second partial derivative of u with respect to y. Just leave this term over to the left hand side and we see in fact that u 
function u does in fact obey Laplace's equation. I can derive a similar equation for v, therefore proving the theorem. So what that tells me, I find an analytic function that's um, I want to satisfy the boundary conditions we had v now on the left hand side for our original problem. Then in fact that is a solution of Laplace's equation. Another feature here that I want to point out is the persistence of Laplace's equation, the fact that uh, we had the upper half of the cylinder grounded, which corresponds to the uh, real positive real axis in the W plane being grounded, and then the lower half of the circle being at potential V0 corresponds to the negative real axis being at potential V9. Okay? Leave that up there for a minute before we move on. down a solution here, and the potential is just equal to v naught over pi. Argument of w, okay? So this is our original problem. Now let's suppose instead that we Now let's suppose we change this such that the upper half is at V0 and the lower half is at minus V0. So the transformation function doesn't change. That's still equal to minus I Z minus 1 over Z plus 1. I'm not going to go ahead and plug in X and um, plug in for Z and then write this in terms of X and Y. Just write this in terms of W. Okay, so we're going to use the same transformation function, but now a uh, different boundary value problem, only in that v naught is on the upper half, minus v naught is on the lower half. How would I modify For just a certain arc of circles, say 30 degrees, 
cylinders at P0, but it's around everywhere else. to the real axis just between this A and some point P. Uh, the potential is going to get B naught and every ball else around it. So let's make a little table here. write my potential in the W plane, my solution, as a superposition of the contribution from argument with respect to the point W and argument with respect to the point P. So to the left of A, both argument of W and argument of W minus P have the value pi. In between this region between the point A and A, where P corresponds to this point on the circle. Um, argument of W is going to be zero, but the argument of W minus P is going to be equal to pi. And then finally to the right of the point P, both of these arguments are equal to zero. So in order to write the solution um, that has a proper value, I want it to be the potential of V naught only here, but zero everywhere else. One way to do that is to write this as argument of W minus P minus argument of W. So in the case where they're both um, lie along the real axis um, greater than point P, everything's zero. So that's right and below. But less than, uh, or to the left of the point A, left of the origin, we have basically pi minus pi, so that's going to vanish. And then only in between that, um, argument of W minus P is equal to pi, the argument is W is equal to zero. So when I take the difference between those is pi minus zero, so that'll be pi, so it'll be V naught. Okay? So this is how you can solve problems with uh, potentials specifying in, in which way just by writing it in terms of the arguments. Um, and of course, you do need to map this back over to the original column. You need to substitute it for W. W is going to be equal to minus I times Z minus 1 over Z plus 1. And then carrying it further, you need to uh, write it in terms of uh, Z in terms of its X and Y in terms of its real and imaginary parts. So I will do that to, to save myself a little bit of time. But these are the three solutions for these three kinds of problems. Uh, next, I want to cover uh, some different kinds of problems where you have more than one cylinder and show how you solve that using conformal mapping. So let's take a look at the kinds of problems you can solve using this technique. Conformal mapping can be used to solve these electrostatic boundary value problems. Finding the exterior potential due to a very long cylinder at potential V naught lying on an infinite grounded conducting plane. And we assume that the cylinder is separated from the plane 
by a small bit of insulation. Finding the potential between two cylinders, the outer cylinder at potential VO and the inner cylinder at potential VI. Again, we assume there's a small bit of insulation separating the two cylinders. And finally, finding the interior potential of a lens-shaped region whose boundaries can be regarded as being formed by the intersection of two circles. One boundary is at potential V1, and the other boundary is at potential V2. The problem here is to find a bilinear transformation that maps the shapes to lines in the W plane. We can also use bilinear transformations to map shapes to concentric circles. One kind of problem might be to find the exterior potential due to a cylinder at potential V0 above an infinite grounded conducting plane. Another kind of problem involves finding the potential between an outer cylinder at potential VO and the inner cylinder at potential VI. I'm going to solve three more electrostatic boundary value problems using the technique of conformal mapping. The first one that we'll look at is finding the potential outside of a very long cylinder that is at potential V0 and that sits on an infinite grounded conducting plane. Uh, essentially, it's a two-dimensional problem. You have a circle whose bottom lies along the real axis, and then you have a straight line corresponding to the infinite grounded conducting plane. Now, the problem here is to find a transformation that's going to map both of these shapes over to a simple geometry. Um, when you're talking about circles and lines, immediately the two simplest geometries that you can think of would be two uh, parallel straight lines corresponding to parallel conducting plates, or you could also think of coaxial cylinders. Now in this case, it turns out it's actually, uh, you want to find a transformation that will map this circle to a straight line, so, and uh, leave this line a straight line as well. If you watch the part one on conformal mapping, this geometry will look familiar to you, so let's go ahead and take a look at the transformation one over z. Under the transformation one over z, the region of space below the line y is equal to minus one, which is traversed from right to left, maps to the interior of a circle of radius one half and whose center is at I one-half. A circle of radius one-half, whose center is located at I one-half, will map to the straight line P is equal to minus one. The interior of the circle maps to the region of space below the line V is equal to minus one. We seek the potential exterior to the cylinder and above the grounded conducting plane. In order to map this region of space, we traverse the contour in the clockwise direction instead of the counterclockwise direction. Under the transformation 1 over z, the line that lies along the real axis in the z plane maps to a line that lies along the real axis in the w plane. Okay, so making use of uh, those results that we already covered, uh, if I apply the transformation 1 over z, and by the way, two, we'll assume that this circle has radius 1 half, if I use this transformation 1 over z, this will map the, this circle and this line the transformation 1 over z will map this circle to a straight line at v is equal to minus 1. Because of the persistence here, uh, the circle is at potential v naught, the line is grounded, so this line at V equals minus one corresponding to the circle is at potential V naught. Now this straight line also passes through the origin, so that just maps as another straight line. And in fact, it'll map from the real axis to the real axis. So this is rounded. So basically, this is just a problem of parallel plate capacitors. And just as a reminder, we'll just write it down. When we draw them uh, the way they're usually drawn, textbooks you usually have the plate that's at potential v naught on top and the ground plate on the bottom. Let's suppose you've got a separation of distance d and let's suppose you want to determine the potential at some distance a above the grounded 
plates, so therefore your potential is equal to V naught A over D. Okay, so over here, therefore, um, the potential between these plates is just going to be uh, the distance up from V naught over the, the distance between them. So as it turns out, the solution there is can be written as minus V naught. And instead of using the character V, I'm going to write this as the imaginary part of W. Same thing, I just wanted this to be a little bit clearer, uh, what we're doing here. Okay, so let's, if um, the imaginary part of W is just zero, in other words, it lies, um, taking a point that lies on the real axis, potential is equal to zero, okay? If the potential is equal to, or rather, if you're on a point at V is equal to minus one, that is to say the imaginary part of W is equal to minus one, you'd have minus V naught times minus one, which is just equal to V naught. And uh, then anywhere between, of course, is just the distance between um, ground plate and the plate is at potential V naught. Now, this time, I'm going to go ahead and substitute back in for Z and write the solution out in terms of X and Y. So this is minus V naught, imaginary part of one over Z. And we'll just go ahead and do the math again. Uh, one over Z is equal to one over X plus I Y. And I'm going to get rid of the complex number in the denominator and just have a real number down there. So this is going to be x minus i y over x squared plus y squared. So we are taking the imaginary part of x minus i y over x squared plus y squared. And that is equal to therefore v naught y over x squared What's y squared? And that's your solution to what looks like a very complicated problem by mapping it over to the W plane, basically mapping the circle and uh, the line over to two parallel lines. You can just write down the solution for uh, the potential between two parallel plate capacitors right away. Now, does this answer make sense? So let's look at some points on here. If y is equal to 0, uh, then, which would correspond to be lying on the, the ground plane, then yes. Uh, the potential is equal to zero, except of course at the origin, uh, where we assume we get a little bit of insulation separating the cylinder from the ground conducting plane. Uh, what about if we take the point right at the top here, corresponding to y is equal to one and x equals zero? Uh, in that case, v is equal to v naught. Uh, what about a point right here, or I should say, right here? In which case. Um, x is equal to one half, and y is equal to one half. We should wind up with v naught. If you plug these numbers in over there, you'll have one half over one fourth plus one fourth. That's just equal to one. So you will in fact wind up with v is equal to v naught. What about as y gets very very large? Well, you'd expect as you get further and further away from the the cylinder that the potential would go to zero. In fact, it does. And likewise, if you get very, very far away in the x direction, the potential will also go to zero as well, and actually will go to zero faster. Okay, so that's how you solve the problem of a very long cylinder, f to be not on an infinite grounded conducting plane. Uh, let me just leave this up here just for a minute before we move on.
In the second problem, we're going to determine the potential between two very long nested cylinders. And here you'll notice that they touch um, at one particular point. Physically, of course, we assume that there's a little bit of insulation separating the two cylinders. Uh, mathematically, though, we make the idealization that they are in contact at this point. The outer cylinder is at potential V0. The inner cylinder is grounded. Now, when you look at this geometry, uh, it's essentially a two-dimensional problem. And we can think of it as being one circle inside of another circle. And your first inclination might be to find a bilinear transformation that maps this geometry to two concentric um, circles. As it turns out, though, we're going to find a bilinear transformation that maps these two circles to two straight lines. And for the sake of this problem, we'll assume that the outer cylinder has unit radius, and the inner cylinder has unit radius 1 half. Because we want to seek the potential between these two uh, circles, Instead of taking the contour in a counterclockwise direction, I'm going to take this contour in a clockwise direction because we are interested in that region of space that's outside of the smaller circle. So we'll label this A, B, C, and D. But we're going to go ahead and take the uh, labels on the outer cylinder in a counterclockwise direction because we are seeking the solution interior of the outside cylinder. I'm going to make up a table here. Now we used cross ratios to find a bilinear transformation. You only need three points, but I'm going to go ahead and throw the fourth point in there anyway. And we have Z and W. Uh, point A is out. 1, B is at 1 minus I over 2, C is at the origin, and D is at 1 plus I over 2. I want to map this inner circle to a straight line that lies along the imaginary axis in the W plane. So because this point is in contact with both circles, if I take the pole to lie at this point, I can map both of those circles over to two straight lines. So I'm going to take point A to lie infinitely far away along the imaginary axis. And C is at the origin. So I'm going to go ahead and map it to the origin in the W plane. Uh, now with B and D, I'm um, going to map point B in the Z plane over to uh, I in the W plane, and D will map over to minus I. So using cross ratios, W minus WA times WB minus WC, all over W minus WC, WB minus WA. Now we have W minus infinity, that term will drop out. Uh, WB minus WC, that's going to be I minus zero. In the denominator, we have W minus WC, that will be W minus zero. And WA minus, uh, WB minus WA, that will be I minus infinity. So those terms that have infinity will cancel out and we'll be left with I over W. Now for the cross ratio for the Z plane, Minus ZA times W minus WA, 
A, that will be Z minus 1. ZB minus ZC, that will be I, rather 1 plus I, that will be 1 minus I over 2 minus 0. And in the denominator, we'll have Z minus ZC, that's just Z minus 0. And ZB minus ZA, that'll be 1 minus A, I over 2 minus 1. And that'll give me Z minus 1 over Z times Uh, 1 minus i all over minus 1 minus i, and if you uh, do the math or that actually is equal to i. So therefore, the linear transformation, bilinear transformation that maps this inner circle of radius 1 half over to the straight line that lies along the imaginary axis is w is equal to z over z minus 1. Okay? Now we use the same bilinear transformation to map this outside circle also to a straight line. And I'll write down another table here. Uh, we have a point A in common, so there's no prime in that. We've got B prime, C prime, D prime. In the Z plane, point A once again lies at 1. B prime lies at point I. C prime lies at minus 1, and D prime lies at minus I. I'm going to plug these points into the transformation. Uh, point A, once again, will map to infinity. And again, it will be uh, infinitely far away from the real axis. So point C prime will map over to 1 half. over 2, and D prime will map over to lies at point A, which both of these circles have in common, I can map both circles over to two parallel straight lines. And notice which way the arrows are pointing. The arrow points up on the line that is mapped from the outside circle. And the line that lies along the imaginary axis, the arrow is pointing downwards. That corresponds to uh, the inner circle. Okay. Now I'm going to write down a solution. Because remember, uh, Laplace's equation is persistent. So this straight line is at potential v naught, and the straight line that lies along the imaginary axis is grounded. By inspection, I can write down what the potential is in the region between these two straight lines. It's going to be v naught, and it's going to be the real part of w. But notice this straight line is distance one half over 
from the imaginary axis. So in order to have uh, satisfying the proper boundary conditions, the potential between these two lines can be written as 2 v naught times the real part of W. And I can substitute in what W is. This will be 2 v naught the real part of Z over Z minus 1. And that's the solution to the problem of two very long nested cylinders. The outside cylinder is at potential V0. The inside cylinder is grounded. And um, we could go ahead and um, plug in for X and Y and find the real part from that. But I'm going to just go ahead and leave it in this form. So this is your answer right here. I'll leave this up here for a minute before we move on. So the final problem we'll look at is determining the potential outside of a cylinder that is at potential be not and lies above an infinite grounded plane. Now this is uh, probably going to have to take a little bit of a different approach here. And the reason why is that you can't find a transformation function that will map both of these shapes over to two straight lines. And the reason why, remember, your bilinear transformation only has a simple pole. If I chose a pole that was on, lies on this circle, that circle would map to a straight line. However, this straight line would map to a circle, so you gain nothing. If you chose a transformation function that had a pole that lies along the um, the real axis, then that line will still map to a line, but this circle will still map to a circle. So once again, you gain nothing. What you'll need to do is find a transformation function that maps both the circle and the line to two concentric circles. Our circle um, centered at phi i and it's um, a unit above the real axis and uh, this is represents your grounded conducting plane. Okay, I'm going to map this over to something that looks like this. The problem is, is that whatever transformation function I choose, it's going to make these concentric. It's not possible at the outset, just by looking at this, just by using the procedures we've discussed so far to know how is this circle going to map over to here. I mean, you can't just say, well, gee, it's going to have the same radius, which we've assumed is 4 right now. It's not going to have the radius 4 over here. So that makes things a little bit difficult. We can't do it the same, do, solve this problem the same way as we did with uh, the two cylinders, the nested cylinders, or with um, the first problem we had, the cylinder lying on the infinite ground conducting plane. As it turns out, uh, we need to add something, another step in here. And at this stage, that's going to take um, us a little bit too far afield, so that really belongs in its own lecture. What I will tell you is that you will need to appeal to symmetry principles in order to derive the transformation function. Like I said, 
it's a little bit too far afield and that really belongs in its own separate lecture. For now, I'm just going to tell you that the function that will map this circle that has radius 4 and lies uh, one unit above the real axis, this transformation function z minus 3i over z plus i uh, plus 3i will map this over to two concentric circles. And uh, the radius of the inner circle is going to be 1 half, and the radius of the outer circle is going to be 1. And this is at v naught, and this is grounded, so this inner circle is actually going to be at radius v naught, and the outer circle and is going to be grounded. Okay? So we're taking a shortcut here. Um, again, but just uh, plug in numbers and convince yourself that in fact this system does map over to these two concentric circles. Now, the question is writing down a solution. Well, the potential in the W plane always going to be as a natural log. absolute value of w over natural log of 1 half. Okay, does this make sense? Well, when, um, when w lies on the circle, it has radius 1, natural log 1, it's just 0, so uh, that will be grounded. If the w lies on the inside circle, w is equal to 1 half, or the absolute value of w is equal to 1 half, so natural log of 1 half divided by natural log of 1 half, it's just equal to 1, and uh, we have you know that from here. Um, so that's your solution. And uh, natural log of 1 half, well, that's just equal to minus uh, natural log of 2. And then we go ahead and plug in what w is. That's just equal to z minus 3i over z plus 3i. And that is your solution. And this concludes part two of conformal mapping.